how do you generate returns in good times? How do you generate returns in bad times? And how do you generate consistent good returns in times without electricity is the key topic I want to discuss today. I want to thank you for the great introduction, Gugu, and for getting the, the energy in the room going. I'm going to start by giving you just a quick overview of, of uh, the history of our firm, Peregrine Capital, and then spend most of the time discussing our investment philosophy, um, the types of um, investments we're making, and where we're seeing opportunities in South Africa right now. So on to the history of our business. Many of you will be aware of this. Um, we're a boutique asset management firm with a 25-year track record. Uh, we're turning 25 in, uh, in July this year and, and two months from now. We manage a bit more than 15 billion rand in investor assets. And we've had a consistent investment process since inception throughout this history and volatile time in South Africa. On the top right of the slide is the, is the two... Um, achievements I'm most proud of that we've achieved as a business, um, and it's being able to deliver 100 times return for investors since inception in our high growth fund over the last uh, kind of 24 years. And then also on Pure Hedge, uh, we're up about 75 times since inception, and that's without ever having a negative year. So if you go on to that, people often ask us, how do we do it? Do we have a crystal ball? Is there one thing we do? And I, I wish it is, I wish it was. My job would be so much easier if it was one or two things you had to do right uh, to deliver consistent returns. But that's just not how this works. Generating investment returns is hard. It requires exceptionally hard work. It requires focus and requires doing a whole range of things consistently right. So if I have to boil it down to the three major categories of, of things we focus on, I think firstly, it's having the right clients, having clients with a long-term mindset that understands how you generate your returns, that partner with you through good times and through, and through tough times, and that allows you to take long-term positions when you see attractive returns available. The second major category is how you set up your business. The people you have, having hard-working, driven people that love investments, that does investments at work, but that don't just see it as a job, that spend their evenings reading investment books, following, on, following what's going on in the world economy and following what's going on in markets. And having the right set of values in your business, things like speed, moving fast when there's new information, things like meritocracy, where the best idea wins, it doesn't matter how old you are or how long you've been with a firm, that set of values in our business is key. And then finally, the investment philosophy and process, which is how we'll spend most of the time today, looking through how we pick stocks and the type of ideas we put in the fund. So all those things together, there's no silver bullet, but all those things together, doing all of them consistently right is what leads to consistent outperformance. So let's spend a few minutes on, on the investment process, a few of the key things that I'll, I think is worth pointing out. So firstly, we invest in our best ideas. I think having an absolute return mindset that's not focused on what weighting shares are in indices, but where we really see exceptional returns available on a specific company is a key thing that differentiates the mindset from the typical large or long only manager that's all about what's in the index, how much am I overweight or underweight, various opportunities. Secondly, Having the discipline to invest in businesses we understand very well and hopefully better than most people in the SA market. Now, this is hard at times. Sometimes you see an interesting opportunity that's not within your sphere of competence, um, and it's, it's very tempting. But we found over the 25 years, sticking with where we have a meaningful edge has, has paid healthy dividends. Thirdly, making sure that valuations are the key underpin of what we do. It's so easy as an investor to chase exciting stories and exciting opportunities while forgetting about valuation. And even we get this wrong, unfortunately, too many times where you love a story or you love a company and you just stay too long or you forget about valuation and that's how you negatively impact your return. So, so making sure that valuation together with the story always uh, is always a key thing to look at. And then fourth, uh, the fifth one I've already touched on, the, the fourth one here, embracing situations that are difficult to understand, that are complicated. I think this is 
where we've built a unique skill set in SA is analyzing and investing in these particularly complicated situations over the years. Things like uh, African Bank uh, when it was in business rescue or was it when it was under curatorship, things like Steinoff, we've made very attractive returns for investors being willing to do hours and hours and hundreds of hours of work uh, where other investors have shied away. So just quickly on our two funds, uh, the high growth and the pure hedge fund, We've typically got fairly consistent positions and exposures or, or, or types of ideas across the funds, but we do adjust the position sizes, the hedging, the shorting to deliver different outcomes for investors. So you'll see high growth has done 15% per annum over the last 10 years with a volatility of around 8% um, and pure hedge has done 12% per annum with a volatility of around 4%. So with Pure Hedge, the goal is consistent returns around 10 to 12% uh, with very low volatility and trying to avoid having a negative year. Where for high growth, we aim for about 15%, doubling your money every five years with volatility similar to or lower than your typical SA balance fund. So let's now go on to the absolute return mindset. If we look at returns last year, I think it was quite an interesting market environment. It was certainly the most difficult one um, since COVID. And you'll see it was very, very hard in 2022 to generate inflation-beating returns. You'll see the number here, inflation, that's unfortunately not um, an investable asset class, beating pretty much all the other major asset classes, all the US markets, global markets, and you'll actually see the SA equity market did, did better than most. What you'll then see is, I guess, our two funds delivering between 12 and 13% for the two funds in a year where it was very, very hard to beat inflation. And that, I guess, comes from the philosophy of not trying to match the overall market, but looking for very specific ideas with specific payoff profiles. And I think it's an extremely valuable thing to do um, in years like 2022 where, where things are difficult. It also does mean that we're not chasing the all share index. So in environments where maybe like a year like 2021 where the all share kind of just ripped higher, that's not the best environment for a hedge fund because we're typically trying to hedge, trying to manage volatility and trying to generate consistent absolute returns. But what we found is throughout our 25 years, if you consistently deliver returns while avoiding the big drawdowns and managing volatility for your clients, you're going to come out much, much better in the end. So let's look at a few tools in the hedge fund toolkit. I think the major um, opportunity that we're seeing right now is in pair trading opportunities in the SA markets. And what it basically allows us to do is find the company we like that we think is performing well, and against that, go short a business that is perhaps in the same sector but underperforming, or that's in a different sector but where there's specific issues. I think before we go into the pair trades, I'll just comment on SA right now because I think it's, it's certainly on everyone's minds. I believe that, that the sentiment in the SA market right now is extremely bearish. And even all of us will feel it. When you speak to friends, when you speak to colleagues, uh, when you think to, your th to yourself, people are very, very negative SA right now. And if I, if I look where that's coming from, it really is one thing. It's not being able to generate electricity. Everything else, the potholes in the road, everything else feels worse because we don't have power. Now, we've therefore done a lot of work ourselves building a detailed model of, of all the supply and, and, and demand um, in, the, in, the, in the SA power sector to understand how long will, will this persist. Because right now when we're chatting to companies, companies are just assuming that stage six is going to persist and trying to run their businesses that way. And I think a lot of individuals are also assuming that. We don't think it's going to be nearly as bad. Certainly the next three or four months is going to be extremely bad. We think that's the worst it gets for the next basically 10 years is this winter. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure clearly there's, clearly there's a different point of view in there, which I, I think is why our view is, is, is not consensus right now. Um, and let, let me give you some of the reasons behind that. Firstly, there's, there's four units of, of Casilla that's currently out. That's about two gigawatts that's coming back between December, January, and February next year. That's two full stages of load shedding. Um, Additionally, there's just a ton of solar going in right now, residential solar. All your friends, family members are most likely putting in solar right now, so that structurally reduces demand. And I think things have now gotten that 
as bad, bad enough that people will just keep going with this. People will save up and they'll put rooftop solar in and luckily we have an amazing sunshine, uh, sunshine country with 300 days of sunshine a year, so it's one of the best places in the world to do solar. And the companies we talk to are making plants. They're going to do solar themselves just to look after themselves. So what you're going to have is demand falling meaningfully as companies and individuals self-provide, and you'll have ESCOM being ESCOM, probably getting slightly better versus now, but it won't be needed in the economy, we think, in about 18 months from now, or it won't be needed to the same extent. And I mean, remember as well, coal power was, uh, the first coal power station was built in 1882 by, by Thomas Edison. So we've delivered coal power in the world for 140 years now. It's not that hard to do. And I think finally our government has put all their attention on one thing, being the electricity situation. They still want to win elections. Um, so, so we think over the next year, a lot of focus, money and time is going into this. So we're much more optimistic um, than most. So how are we managing the portfolio in that context is firstly, we're going to touch on the pair trades that we're doing. So finding companies that we think will get through this winter and get through this year with their earnings intact, trying to find shorts where the earnings will fall out of bed or companies that will have a tougher time because of the load shedding. But what we've also been doing in the last two months, given the bearishness around, is we've taken um, the posing view and said, we think the next 12 months will be very tough, but we think after that, things will be better. And if you've got shares that's priced at some of them global financial crisis type levels, we think that's fantastic opportunities over the next year or two. And the fact with the way markets work is you simply cannot wait for the news to be better. Once the news is better, the share prices will be up already. You've got to do this while everyone else is negative. Let's look at a few of the pair trading opportunities to, to highlight, even in the tough environment, you can find opportunities for absolute returns without making necessarily sector or stock specific bets. So in this case, uh, the pair between Woolworths and two of the other retailers that we'd rather not name on the short side. Um, and this was driven by Woolies finally turning around their clothing business, them being willing to sell their Australian business, um, David Jones, um, and also, to some extent, over the last three or six months, catching up to ShopRite on the online delivery and SA that we think will will um, will narrow the gap there and close the gap between checkers outperforming Woolies. Just showing that you can find, even in a tough sector that's impacted by load shedding, you can find great relative winners. This one is an interesting one. It's in the insurance sector. Um, we don't particularly like the life insurance sector right now. We think it's one of the toughest sectors in SA, mainly because of all the banks saying, we're pretty mature as a banking market, let's, let's penetrate the insurance sector. It's a big sector, we've got the primary relationship with the client, um, let's go steal the lunch from the insurance companies. And where do they start? They start at the most profitable, highest margin product, being the funeral policy. So you've seen Capitec and F&B pretty much being two of the three biggest um, sellers of insurance products in SA right now, uh, eating the lunch of the likes of all mutual and other insurance players. So that's why we're cautious on the sector as a whole, but again, it doesn't mean you can't make money in the sector. So in this example, what you do is you go along um, Momentum Metropolitan. Um, we think the share was extremely cheap. It's well managed. They're returning capital to shareholders. They're looking for share buybacks. And we go short one of the other large life insurers. And you'll see why the pair trade is important. You'll see that Momentum hasn't really done much in the year. It's about flat. But because your short's down 20%, 25%, you can make 25% on, on this pair trade, adding alpha to the portfolio without adding beta. And finally, one other tool you have is finding sectors that we think will outperform the overall market. So a sector we particularly like right now is the, the SA banks. Um, you've got two things playing, uh, playing off with the banks. Rates are going up, which means you're going to have more impairments. Everyone's mortgage payments and car payments are going up, so you're going to have more impairments. But a bank has a huge endowment benefit from its own capital inv invested in cash. And at the same time, it's got a lot of client deposits on where it's paying the client 0, 1 or 2%, the fairly fixed rate. And as rates go up, the bank can lend out that money at higher and higher rates. So that, to a large extent, offsets your increase in impairments. And we actually think bank earnings still grow nicely this year. And, on the other, and with that, you've got 
business like NetBank and, and Standard Bank and APSA actually all on 8% dividend yields. So you've got 8% in the bank to start the year together with some earnings growth. Uh, we think that's a great value proposition. So in this case, we like the bank sector a lot. We don't want excessive net exposure and excessive exposure to SA. So you go long a business like NetBank, you go short the, the cap Swix index or derivative against that, and you capture that outperformance by picking the right sector and going short the market. The, the next toolkit is then looking for uncorrelated opportunities, things that will play out and where the returns will get generated independent of what happens in the market. One example that I think is a nice one to cover here is ABSA's international uh, tier one bonds. Um, so these bonds will pay out as long as ABSA remains a solvent entity. Um, last year in the market panic, in the middle of last year, you'll see they sold off to about a 700 basis point, 750 basis point spread at peak. So uh, we've got those circles, that's the time when, when we built this position. And what we do in our funds is we then swap this back to RANDs. So we buy this dollar bond, swap it back to RANDs and make it an SA floating rate instrument paying you 700 basis points above the short rate. So where rates are at 8% now, we've got this APSA bond paying you 15% in the funds. And we think that's a fantastic risk reward prospect in a tough environment where the outlook is uncertain. What do, you, what do you get if you put sufficient amount of pair trades, the right long ideas and uncorrelated ideas together? You get, a, you get a return stream that is not correlated to the overall SA fund management industry. You'll see the red bars there as the five largest uh, collective investment schemes in SA. And the interesting bit is that they really are, while they're different managers, they're all simply 80 to 90% correlated to the overall JSC Cap Swix index. If you look at high growth, it's only about 45% correlated over the last year, and pure edge has pretty much zero correlation to the return stream of the overall market. So you really are adding a return stream here that was generated with different building blocks to what the typical manager uses to generate uh, his returns. So let's see what the outcome is of this. Um, I think this is an interesting analysis, looking back over the last 25 years and saying, how does our funds perform in various environments on the JSC? So you'll see the JSC had about 60% positive months and 40% negative months over that time. And on the, on, the, on, the, on, the pic, on the graph on the right, you'll see in the average positive month the JSC has, it's actually 4% on average, um, you'll see the high growth fund at two and a half. As I touched on earlier, hedge funds might struggle to keep up in times when there's raging bull markets, but luckily that's not all the time, or, or, or luckily for us that's not all the time. The key differentiator then comes in the down months, 3% negative on average, and our funds are actually marginally up in that time. Show you, it's showing you it's the shock absorber in your portfolio um, in the negative periods, and if you add that consistency together, you'll see on average it leads to meaningful outperformance and that, comp that difference obviously then compounds over time. So this graph is a bit chaotic and I'll, I'll give you some time to take it in. Um, what we've done here is we've plotted basically every, every unit trust, um, every equity fund, every balance fund, every multi-asset low equity fund in South Africa. And you'll actually see, if you exclude our funds, it does make quite a nice, um, efficient frontier. It made me think back to um, when I was at university um, in, my, in my honors years at Stellenbosch, I think I was about 21 at the time, we had a course financial mathematics. So this is where I, I guess you learned about a lot of these things at the first, for, for the first time. And one of the things the lecturer told us about was the efficient market hypothesis that says that um, all share prices are correct at all times and it's correctly reflecting all information. And we then, I mean, it's a theoretical course, so you then go through the assumptions behind, um, behind that. And one of the, the, the key assumptions is all investors and participants in the market are rational at all times. And I remember even at that stage, look, so you typically believe what your lecturer tells you, right? I mean, that they had a professor and you're just a student. And I remember lying awake in my bed that night and thinking, 
geez, I've got a lot of 21-year-old friends at, at residence here, and very few of them are rational, very, 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 very little of the time. Even myself, uh, I've got periods of time where I'm not rational. So it's, it just didn't make sense to me. Humans are not rational. There's times where our emotions get the better of us. Um, little did I know that I would then spend most of my life and career trying to disprove the efficient market hypothesis. But you can see on the efficient frontier, there's two clear outliers being our pure hedge um, and high growth funds. Um, for 4.5% for vol over the last 10 years, the pure hedge fund has delivered the 12% returns, significantly better than everything in the multi-asset low equity category. And then if I look at the balance fund category, all those dark red dots, high growth is just a very, very clear outlier there, both at the lower end of the, of the risk spectrum and then significantly higher than the rest on the, on the return spectrum. So what happens to a portfolio when you add this? Um, just think to yourselves and ask yourself the question, when I pick a fund to add to my client portfolios or to my own portfolios, what are the key things that you look for? So I'd argue that the key things you want is you want a high expected return, and at the same time, you want that fund to reduce the overall risk in your portfolio. That, for me, is really the holy grail of investing. High expected returns, but low correlation to other asset classes, leading to an enhanced return for the portfolio while at the same time reducing risk. And we think that's what kind of hedge funds can do for your overall portfolio. So as an example, we, we, we took our two funds and said, let's say you've got a 60, typical 60 equity, 40 bonds portfolio you're managing for clients. Um, let's say you add 20% hedge funds or 40% hedge funds, half of each of our two funds to this, what does it do to the portfolio return? What you'll see here is the annual rise return goes up substantially. Let's just use a 20% example, 8% expected return going to 9.5% expected return max drawdown going from minus 20 to minus 15, and your vol falling from 10 to 8. So that's really what you're looking for when you're adding a fund to the portfolio, and I'm sure there's many alternative investments today that can help you generate uh, and, and, and do that in your, in your portfolios. So to end off with, um, I, um, I'm, I'm very passionate about the, the um, event, things happening in AI right now, um, I'm sure it's, it's, it's most of you all picked up. It's, it's been a big part of the news over the last six months. So since GPT-4 um, or GPT-3 chat came out in la last year, November, it was just clear to me that this was a game-changing technology. So I've been fairly obsessed with the product for the last six months, constantly using it, running ideas through it, um, kind of asking it interesting questions. And it's, it's just amazing that we now have basically computers that can speak to us like we're humans. Um, the, 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 it's, it's basically already smarter than, I think, maybe a third, maybe half um, kind of the, the human population, and it's only going to get better from here. So one of the interesting um, long-term implications of this is there is a scenario where AI massively reduces productivity around the world, where basically most services jobs will get significantly more productive, and AI will end up kind of doing many of those, um, many of those jobs itself. So there are scenarios where 30, 50 years down the line, we really have a world of abundance, where most people in the world can have access to most of the products and services they want at extremely low cost. There is scenarios where the work week becomes, from, goes from 40 hours to 20 hours, um, or where people can just choose not to work. The, these are real credible scenarios in my head for the next 30 or 50 years. So um, one of my off-piece bull cases for South Africa is actually linked to this. If you say which jobs are these are, 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 um, LLMs and other AI products going to replace, it's, it's going to replace services jobs. Which jobs are not going to be replaced? Or which things can, I, can you not replace? You need physical resources, so you need, you need mining to generate all the, the iron and the silicon and everything else you, you need to put into, in, into the products. So you need mining, you still need food for the population. So a country like South Africa with highly productive farmlands, great weather, great mining resources, actually fits into that. Um, secondly, if people don't have to work, well, they've got to work 20 hours a week, where do they want to stay? 
They're going to want to stay not in these massively dense capitals of the world like New York or London. They're going to want to stay in places with great weather, with great coastlines, um, and with just a great quality of life, lots of space. So I can certainly see a 30 or 50 year massive bull case for places like South Africa because of this. Um, getting, back to, uh, getting back to our funds, um, <laughs> getting back to our funds, uh, I, I think the, uh, what, I, what, I, what I hope you got away from, from today for our funds and the hedge fund category as a whole is it is a way to add true diversification uh, to your portfolios, low correlation and very high expected returns. So, as I end, I, I, I hope you've, you've learned a few things from the presentation, and then on the other hand, I also hope that um, I've given you some alternative perspective on South Africa. I really think, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not a very tough time right now, but personally, I think we'll get through it. Um, I've been through several bear market cycles and markets, and this is very much how it feels at bear market lows. This is why shares get cheap. This is why when people look back at the graphs, they think, why didn't I buy the low in 08? Why didn't I buy the low in 2003? Because lows feel like this. You feel negative. Uh, you feel like you don't want to buy it. You feel like you, don't want to, you just want to sell. Uh, that's what it feels like. And I think we're at one of those right now. And hopefully, when we stand here in a year or two's time, um, SA shares have done very well, and, and the outlook looks much better. So thank you very much for, your, for all your time. Let's go out there and take advantage of the, of the opportunities.